Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to this Ophir Photonics webinar. My name is Mark Slutsky, I'm the Product Manager for Power and Energy Measurement Solutions here at Ophir Photonics, and thanks for joining us today. I hope everyone is uh, keeping healthy and maybe even managing to keep sane, two entirely separate things. Um, but, you know, we continue moving forward and you know, we're all waiting for that magic uh, cure or whatever it is, but uh, no shortage of interesting things to be to be dealing with um, meanwhile. So hopefully we'll look at some interesting things now. The topic we're going to be covering is how to choose, as the name says, how to choose the best choice of laser power meter and sensor. Um, I'm assuming that anyone who's uh, you know, joining a webinar on a topic like this is either a user of laser measurement instrumentation or is evaluating, you know, pending the need, expected need to, to use um, such measurement instruments. Perhaps you're already users of Ophir um, photonic measurement instruments uh, or are evaluating or even if maybe, God forbid, you're using a different manufacturer's equipment, but hopefully we'll have managed to keep the information here sufficiently generic that uh, there will be some information, you know, information of maximal use to as many of you as possible. So just before we begin, a more uh, logistical note. The total time of our webinar today, today should be approximately 45 to 50, that's five zero uh, minutes plus minus. Questions, comments are welcome, maybe even encouraged. If you have any questions or comments, please use the text chat box on the right side of your screen, and I'll do my best to respond either in real time or at a suitable point in the flow of the information, depending on the nature and the timing of the questions and comments. And on that same topic, I should also add that I will be leaving my contact information up on the final slide for a couple of minutes after we conclude, um, in case you want to take that down and, you know, get in touch with me offline afterwards, you're more than welcome to do that. And if I'm already mentioning all of that, I'll also add that you can contact us anytime through our website or through the Ophir, either Ophir offices or Ophir partners, representatives in your various countries. Um, if you don't know who those are, well, the, on our website, on the main page of the Ophir Photonics uh, website, at the top right-hand side of the main menu, there's a Contact Us page, and on that page you can find per country um, who you want to speak to. Also, in the bottom of, I believe, every single page on our website, there's some kind of a Contact Us form. We do want to make it as easy as possible for you to get a hold of us if there's any way in which you can serve you somehow or if you just want to offer some feedback or comments or something like that. So with the, all of that out of the way, uh, let's proceed. I should just mention this morning, which was many hours ago, it's evening time over here, um, I had a bit of a technical glitch with our internet connection. I, as meant so many of us are, I'm working from home right now. Uh, it's the only time that's happened in many months, and, you know, thank God it hasn't happened since I think I sorted it out. But I'm just mentioning that in case for some reason, some unexpected, I don't know what happens, and you lose me, don't go away. I have prepared an alternate Wi-Fi network here in my house, so in case something really goes dreadfully wrong, I will as quickly as humanly possible switch and I'll come right back and rejoin. I hope it won't happen. It shouldn't happen. but just in case, it's always good to be prepared. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, I, again, I'm assuming you're at least somewhat familiar with Ophir, maybe very familiar with Ophir. You, know, you probably know that some years back we were acquired by Newport and became part of the Newport family, and then a couple years after that, um, two, three, four, I don't remember, years ago, uh, Newport along with Ophir were acquired by MKS Instruments, and we're now part of the global MKS um, brand. Basically, what it says on this slide is that we like to do the hard stuff so that you can unload that and concentrate on what you're doing and the work that you're good at and not have to lose any sleep over the tools that you need to help you get your work done. I think that that was a pretty decent summary of what it said on that slide. Okay, so here's what we're going to be covering. Um, we're going to be covering sensors and we're going to be covering meters. And I'm going to explain what each of those are. Um, and again, our topic today is, you know, 
how to most effectively choose the best possible sensor and meter for your particular needs. We're not going into any great engineering depth about how they work. We're just going to maybe touch on a few topics, really, really, really scratching the surface just where it's needed to give meaning to the conversation about how to choose the right ones. Um, we could go into unlimited depths and spend unlimited time. We will not do that. Um, so I hope that I'll have found the most effective and useful balance between breadth and depth and scope and fulfilling the stated purpose of this discussion. Uh, okay, so first of all, just to get clear, typical laser measurement instrument, this is actually uh, in the one of the Ophir uh, calibration labs, one of our technicians. The laser beam here, as you can probably guess, uh, is the only thing here that is kind of not real because you can't really see a laser beam unless you're looking into it, in which case you you might not be able to see much of anything afterwards. The only way you'd see the beam is if, you know, we'd spray mist into the area. But I digress. Um, but as you can see, the technician is using a sensor and meter to measure uh, the power of this laser beam. So the sensor is the, the front end or the back end, depending which way you're facing. It's the laser facing and the input. It's the transducer that receives the laser beam to be measured and produces some kind of an electrical signal that represents the parameter of interest, like power or energy, for example. Um, the meter is the other end, the user-facing end, which receives the signal coming out of the sensor, does some processing, and then outputs the measured reading, such as via a numeric display to a human user, or maybe a digital interface to some host system controller. We're going to look at mainly the sensors since the differences among sensors are physical, technical, but we will be spending some time also talking about choosing a meter as well. Um, oh, okay, I ran ahead of my animation. Okay, here you see a typical sensor and meter combination. Different manufacturers use different words. Uh, years ago at Ophir, we used to call these heads and these displays, we changed it to sensors and meters. Other manufacturers call the meter a console or a controller. As long as we all know what we, what we each mean, then it doesn't really matter a whole lot uh, what words we choose to call them. Um, okay. When you start going about choosing the right measurement solution, so let's begin with the sensor. The sensor, as we said, the differences between sensors are physical, technical. Um, as you can appreciate, a sensor that you're going to use to measure, you know, picowatt beams are going to be very different from the sensors you would choose if you need to measure multi-kilowatt industrial laser beams. And choosing the wrong sensor could have pretty, you know, serious consequences. So the differences between sensors are physical, technical. The differences between meters are more functional. Um, let's be honest, most meters do fundamentally the same thing. They receive the analog signal coming out of the sensor. In the case of Ophir sensors, that analog signal is an electrical current, and the meter in our case is a very intelligent uh, picoameter. It's a very intelligent current meter with all sorts of bells and whistles added to give functionality. But fundamentally, the measurement instrument part of the meter is a current measuring device. Then we need to measure the current. We need to know how to interpret that so that we'll know what power or energy or whatever that current represents when it's coming from that sensor. And then we want to add all the different, you know, capabilities. How do we want to display that to the user? Uh, does the user want to perform any kind of analytical functions on the reading and so on and so on? We'll touch on some of those over the next couple minutes. But the differences between meters aren't physical, technical. If you accidentally choose the wrong sensor, um, it's going to potentially have significant impact on what you're measuring. If you accidentally choose the wrong meter, the measurements will still be the same, but the additional functions you might want to perform with those measurements um, might be accidentally not what you wanted. Um, so let's begin with sensors. As I said, there it's more technical physical, so there's more technical details to talk about with choosing sensors. So let's begin with sensors for measuring average power. 
I'm calling it average power and not just power to differentiate it from peak power, which some, in some applications is a term that gets used to describe the instantaneous power during a pulse, which might not be the same as the average power of the overall, let's say, repetitively pulsed beam. So average power, how many watts, milliwatts, kilowatts are in the beam? Um, we might talk about measuring the average power of a continuous, of a CW beam, or of a repetitively pulsed beam. If you have a beam pulsing at a few hertz or a few kilohertz, in application A, you might really only be interested in knowing the overall rate of flow of energy, the wattage, the watts, the power of that beam. In other applications, you might need to know the energy of each one of those pulses individually. Um, so now we're talking about measuring the average power. Um, so a bunch of different things that you need to take into account when choosing uh, the, cor the most correct sensor. Um, before I start going through all of these, I'm just going to kind of run ahead of myself for a second so that nobody goes into a tizzy. At the end of this section, I'm going to tell you why there's no need to panic because there are tools available to make this choice easier. But first, it's helpful to understand all the considerations that go into the equation, all the different ingredients that have to get thrown into the pot in order to get the right dish out of the pot. And then we'll look at how most of the cooking can be done with the help of some tools. Um, but now let's pretend that I didn't say don't panic, just so that we'll see everything that goes into here. Because the more you understand about the thought process of choosing a sensor, the better you'll understand the results you get from the what we call the sensor finder tool, and the more readily you'll be able to notice if something about the results it gives you doesn't make sense, and then you'll notice, oh, I used the wrong units. I used milliwatts instead of watts. You'll know that, so, so you'll have an intuitive feel for whether you're at the, you know, you're in the right direction. So the most obvious parameter you need to consider is the power level, as we said, nanowatts, kilowatts, very different kind of sensor, very different animal. We're just going to run through the list and then we'll look at each one in a little bit of detail. Spectral range, different materials absorb different wavelengths of light you know, differently. Um, big beams, small beams, you might think, well, why not just take a big sensor so that I don't have to worry about whether it's a big beam, small beam. It's not always so simple. There are always trade-offs, as, as we'll see. If it's a repetitively pulsed beam whose power you're trying to measure, the pulse details, the pulse repetition rate, the pulse width um, could also affect the choice. Okay, so let's look at each of these now separately. Um, first of all, the power level, sensitivity. Um, typically, for measuring powers from tens of microwatts, maybe, and upwards, one usually will use a thermal sensor. Again, we're not going to go into the details of how they work. You're probably somewhat familiar uh, in any case, but regardless, it not, it's not critical for our conversation right now. Um, usually from milliwatts or tens of milliwatts and upwards, but we at Ophir, we have thermal sensors that can go down to 8 or 10 microwatts. Um, which is quite sensitive for these kind of sensors. So I'm sort of generally categorizing this as moderate and upwards. We also have a thermal power sensor that can measure up to 120 kilowatts and everything in between. So for those, we'll typically use a thermal sensor. Um, for lower powers than that, from down to picowatts, nanowatts, up to hundreds of milliwatts, maybe a couple of watts, usually we'll use a photodiode sensor. Those are much more inherently sensitive than thermal sensors. As you can, as you're probably aware, there's a price to be paid. Their spectral response is, is much narrower and not nearly as flat. There's, you know, it's not by accident that the word trade-off is usually one of the first words you learn in, in any kind of an engineering curriculum. Uh, and there are sensors for going down to extremely low power levels, down to into the femtowatt range. Uh, they're usually referred to as radiometers. That's a word that kind of means all sorts of things to all sorts of different people, but it's commonly used to refer to these sort of sensors. Um, again, we're not going into engineering depth, even though it's a fascinating technology, but usually these are based on either pyroelectric or photodiode sensors uh, with some electronics a lock-in amplifier, if that means something to you, that enables 
the sensor to eliminate the background, which otherwise would swamp these very, very weak signals that you're trying to measure and allows you to measure signals that are otherwise would have been way below the noise floor of that type of sensor. So you can use a less than exotic detector to measure what otherwise is a pretty exotic low power level. Um, Okay, still on the topic of sensitivity. So let's zoom in a little bit here. We see some photodiode-based sensors for measuring low powers. Picowatts up to, as we said, several hundred milliwatts typically. Various types based on different semiconductor detectors for different spectral regions. Silicon for you know, near UV through the visible to the near IR. In gas, indium, uh, indium gallium arsenide, uh, or germanium for the near IR, typically like 700, 800 nanometers out to 1700, 1800 nanometers. Most of that sort of applications that we're looking at don't really usually go farther out than that. Um, higher power levels, of course, industrial applications, you've got mid IR, far IR, CO2 lasers, and that sort of thing. Those typically don't go down to the sort of nanowatt, picowatt kind of power levels for which one would need photodiodes. There are some applications that, are, that do involve, you know, a little bit, I won't call them exotic, but mid IR and longer wavelengths at power levels lower down than the microwatts that are the lower limit for thermal sensors. And that's where those radiometer things come in. We'll briefly touch on that in a couple of minutes. So here we see a bunch of um, photodiode based sensors. I forgot to mention in my opening lines that um, as, as I did mention, I promised I'm trying to keep information generic. But as soon as it comes to real life examples of actual devices, you'll appreciate that I'm using Ophir actual devices because those are the only ones I can really speak about. So here you see wand configurations, round configurations, if it needs to be, if the detector needs to be centered over the mounting base in case, you know, it's part of a setup mounted on an optical table in a lab or something like that. Uh, you can see uh, there's some uh, accessories here, fiber adapters and that sort of thing. Um, Where's the forward button here? Um, and here's a selection of some typical thermal sensors, as we said, for measuring moderate and upward power levels. Uh, you can see that there's different size apertures. You can maybe get an idea if the resolution of the WebEx tool we're using is enough that there's different kinds of absorbers. You might realize that a couple of these have a diffuser built in. In some of them, you can see that the body of the sensor has fins. It's uh, it's designed to serve as a heat sink for power levels that are high enough to need that. We'll talk about that in about a minute, um, and so on. Um, I mentioned the radiometer that's used to go down to sometimes extremely low power levels. The details obviously depend on the model and on the on the and on the. But the basic idea is that you've got a chopper which chops or modulates the beam at a very specific frequency. For Ophir radiometers, that happens to be 18 hertz, but that's not critical in theory. And a sensor, in some models, it's based on a pyroelectric detector. In one model, it's based on a, on a UV-enhanced silicon photodiode. And what happens is that the electronics in this electronic module has in it a digitally synthesized um, lock and amplifier circuit. And what it does is it eliminates any signal that's not modulated at exactly 18 hertz. And the idea is that the, we bring the source right up to the chopper so that the beam we're trying to measure is modulated with 100% modulation uh, at 18 hertz, but background light and noise, in, inherent noise of the sensor are not modulated at 18 hertz, and the circuitry will eliminate anything other than 18 hertz. And by doing that, we're entirely cutting out background, and by several orders of magnitude, we're reducing the inherent noise, and that enables us to measure powers that are way below, as we said, the noise floor, or what should have been the noise floor for this sensor. Um, it looks a bit clunky, but it's actually much more elegant than having to use a significantly more expensive exotic kind of cooled, you know, cryogenically cooled detector or something like that. 
We mentioned cooling, so let's just talk a little bit about that. For low power picowatts, nanowatts, the body of the sensor is, has enough contact with air that the heat that's being generated by the incoming laser beam can be removed to the surrounding air just by straightforward conduction with the air, and that's more than enough. As soon as you get up to you know, a couple tens of watts and upwards, then we need to start helping that process to happen. So usually the first step will be that the sensor body will be designed to serve as some kind of a heat sink. Fins, in the case of Ophir sensors, we have a proprietary design that we call pin fins, which happens to be the most efficient way that we found for getting the most heat out of the sensor with the least volume of body. Um, <laughs> The idea is that as a laser beam comes into the sensor and gets absorbed and measured, um, the resulting heat has to be removed at least as fast as it's coming in, or it'll start to build up in the sensor. And if the temperature inside builds up and builds up, eventually it could reach a point where it gets high enough to damage the sensor. And usually the first point of failure in thermal sensors would be a disconnect in the thermal pile junctions, which would result in what I might call instant sensor death. Um, you know, not, not a good thing. Um, so sensors are generally designed so that their body can remove heat at up to a certain rate, and that rate determines the maximum rated power of that 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 sensor is specified for. I will mention, and we'll see this coming into play in about, I think, two slides, uh, that we have a few sensors that are fear that have in them a disk, like the basic sensing element that can measure actually significantly higher power than the body of the sensor knows how to dissipate. Why would we do that? Because many, in many applications, the measurement is done intermittently. You expose the sensor to the beam, you take a measurement, it takes five seconds maybe, and then it may be quite a bit of time before you're gonna need to take another measurement. So if you can, if that's how you work, then we, you don't necessarily need the fan cooling or water cooling because the overall average rate of heat coming into the sensor is not so much. It might be a lot of power, but coming into the sensor, but only for a few seconds and then stopping. And that total amount of heat that gets absorbed then might not be so much. And the temperature in the sensor might not go up all that much. And then as long as you wait enough time before taking another measurement for the heat to be dissipated at the slow rate that that sensor's body is able to do, then we're good. So we have a number of sensors that work that way. Um, and I'm gonna already steal a bit more of my thunder and mention that we can actually take that a step farther and use it as a trick to enable using small sensors to measure very high powers, but let's not run ahead of ourselves too much. Let's, uh, you know, keep the anticipation going. Well, here we are. Okay, I did run ahead of myself. It's, there's a special mode that we have in some of our instruments called pulsed power. It's a sneaky detour. Okay, I forgot that it was already here, so here we are. <clears throat> um, I'll just briefly tell you what this does. Um, thermal sensors, as we're gonna see shortly, can also be used for measuring energy, not of repetitive pulses, but of single pulses. Um, what pulse power does, is we expose the sensor, which knows how to measure only, let's say, low average powers. We expose it to a very high power beam, but only for, let's say, some fraction of a second. If we treat that short exposure, not as power measurement, power measurement would need a couple seconds, uh, but as an energy measurement, we treat that short exposure as if it were a single pulse. And we measure its energy, which the sensors and meters know how to do, it's pretty standard, not just the fear, that's pretty standard in, in the industry. Um, and then we divide the measured energy by the known length of that exposure, then you know, energy over time is power. That gives us the instantaneous power during that pulse, which you and I know is actually the average power of the beam. We turned it into a pulse only because we exposed the sensor to it for a short, a very, very short time. Now, the, doing that division, I assume all of us would be able to do that, and that's uh, almost trivial, but in pulsed power mode, the instruments that, the Ophir instruments that support this mode do it either automatically or semi-automatically. Semi-automatically means they prompt the user to enter the known pulse with the exposure time, half a second, one second, point one second, whatever, and then it does the division, autom does the calculation by itself. Okay, that 
certainly makes life easier. And then it, it uh, um, displays the reading in units of power. Fully automatically is when the instrument has a fast photodiode that measures the exposure time by itself. We have a few instruments like that, which are meant for integration into a factory floor where there isn't a human user actually operating the thing. Um, so that's pulsed power mode. It's going to pop up again a little bit later when we talk about meters. I'm dropping you a little hint. Okay, another item that we had on that list of considerations is the absorber type, the spectral range. Um, different absorber materials absorb different wavelengths differently. Um, some, some absorber materials are broadband, some are very not broadband. That also needs to be taken into account. Um, here you see you don't need to look at all the details. This is just a bunch of graphs in, in our catalog and on our website of all the different absorber types and their spectral curves. I should mention that if any of you specifically have one of these sensors and you want not just the curve, but you need to know actual numerical data, I should mention the Excel tables, all the numerical data that's hiding behind all of the curves in any of our data sheets. We've got all of that data. It's readily available. If you need any, any of it, uh, then certainly feel free to ask, and you know, we've got all of that stuff. Um, beam size. It sounds trivial. It usually is, but not always. Okay, big beam, small beam, sensors with large apertures, small apertures. So first of all, it's kind of obvious to anyone who's familiar with these things that the bigger the aperture, meaning the bigger the detector element in the sensor, the higher the inherent thermal noise is going to be, which means the higher the minimum measurable power of that sensor is going to be. If a sensor like this can measure down to X milliwatts, a sensor like this might only be able to measure down to maybe 100 milliwatts. I'm just throwing out, you know, random examples to illustrate the point. So that, that's one obvious consideration. Um, in general, um, you don't want the beam, the beam to be too big, and you don't want the beam to be too small. There's always a bit of a tension there. Um, you don't want it too big because you don't want to lose the outer edges of the beam that are falling outside your sensor's aperture. And I should mention, and not everyone is aware of this, that if you have a Gaussian beam or something like that, or anything that's on a perfect flat top beam profile, then the outer edges of the beam might not be so visible. Um, and you might not realize that you're cutting off a significant percentage of the total beam and getting an incorrectly low power reading. Um, so one needs to be careful of that. We've got a lot of information about that on our website. If it's a Gaussian beam, generally a good guideline is you want the aperture to be at least one and a half times the one over E squared beam diameter to make sure that the not obvious part of the beam is also entering your sensor. Um, cutting off the outer edges is an effect that we call vignetting uh, from, I think it's a Latin or French root that means window. Um, you also don't want the beam to be too small. First of all, a given number of watts concentrated into a small enough spot is what we use in a lot of industrial applications to cut, weld, burn, drill, and otherwise zap material. Um, and if you think that you want to measure power in the focal spot, you may very possibly be cutting, welding, drilling, or otherwise zapping your sensor. And that's going to mean an extensive repair. So you don't want to measure the beam power at the focal point, unless you do. There are solutions in certain cases for measuring certain things in the focal point, but we don't need to get into that. But if you ever come across such a need, more often it's to, a need to measure the shape of the focal spot and the location of the focal spot, the beam profile. We've got solutions for that. Not going to get into the details now, but if that rings a bell with some of you, just be aware that there are solutions for that. Um, in general, it's the same number of watts in focus as out of focus, or the same number of joules in focus as out of focus, but it's certainly not the same number of watts per square centimeter. And too many watts per square centimeter is what cuts, welds, drills, or otherwise zaps. So we don't want to do that. Usually, it's just a question of finding a suitable location for the sensor where the beam is defocused enough that we're not at the damage threshold, the maximum power density above which we're in danger, um, without getting the beam so big that we might be missing some of it. Obviously, there are going to be applications where we don't have such freedom of movement. If you have a specific you know, problem that you'd like help solving, certainly, certainly 
uh, speak to us. Um, where is the forward button? Here we are. Um, since we just were mentioning big beams and small beams, I should just say a few words about measuring widely diverging beams. On the one hand, you know, widely diverging beams, so just use a big enough sensor to capture all of it. Sometimes that's a good enough solution, but sometimes it isn't. Usually, often, I think I can even say usually, the solution for capturing and measuring an entire widely diverging beam involves the use of an integrating sphere with a sensor built in and the whole thing calibrated together as an instrument. Um, again, not getting into the details now of how those work. Um, here's a typical integrating sphere. In this case, it's a six inch um, outer diameter, 5.3 inch inner diameter sphere, four ports. One of them is occupied by the sensor. The whole thing is calibrated with the sensor. The other ports can be, well, one port is gonna be used for the beam input either free space or through a fiber adapter or something like that. And the other ports can be used also with fiber adapters for different accessories, for sampling out a portion of the beam to another instrument like a spectrometer or a, you know, fast photo detector for, you know, a temporal pulse shape characterization. That's often a need with, uh, you know, uh, for manufacturers or integrators working with Vixels. Um, and since I'm mentioning Vixels, by the, you know, by chance, um, here's a multi-function integrating sphere sensor that we developed at Ophir a couple of years ago specifically for Vixel manufacturers uh, or integrators. Um, it's a small sphere, one and a half inch. Um, the beam comes in, there's an integrated power sensor, so you get uh, you know, calibrated power measurements. There's a fast photodiode for temporal pulse shape characterization with a BNC output to a scope. Um, and there is an additional fiber connector for sampling light out to a spectrometer. Um, it's a small sphere to eliminate pulse stretching effects um, if you've got a big sphere. It's a very cool thing, not getting into that now. Um, okay, so just I had to mention that for the sake of completeness. Um, we mentioned in that list of considerations pulse details. You might be asking, but wait, we're talking about sensors for measuring average power. Why do I care about the pulses? Well, the truth is, even if we're not interested in the energy per pulse of our repetitively pulsed beam, we're maybe only interested in the average power of our repetitive, repetitively, sorry, it's evening time, past my dinner time, of our repetitively pulsed beam. But even so, we still need to take account of the pulse details to prevent damage from too high energy density. Um, there's two kinds of damage threshold, as we call it. There's a maximum power density above which a given absorber is in danger of getting you know, local burn damage. And there's a maximum energy density above which the absorber material is in danger of getting damaged. Now, the maximum energy density among other things, is a function of the pulse width. Long pulses and short pulses have very different behavior. Because in a short pulse, the heat that's generated by the end of the pulse getting absorbed um, meets up with the heat that had been generated from the beginning of the pulse getting absorbed. And if the pulse is a nano, you know, Q-switch laser, pulse width of a few nanoseconds, the heat that was generated from the beginning of the pulse getting absorbed has not had time to move anywhere in the absorber material. So all of those joules per square centimeter contained in that pulse are all sitting there concentrated in a very thin layer of surface material. Whereas if the pulse is long, meaning a couple hundred microseconds, milliseconds, then the heat has had enough time to move even a little bit uh, and that makes a huge difference. So this also is something that needs to be taken into account um, in order to choose a sensor that will survive the experience of measuring this laser beam, um, even if we're not interested in measuring the energy of the pulses themselves. Um, let's talk about sensors for measuring energy per pulse now. Um, thermal sensors have a physical thermal physical time constant on the order of a second or seconds, depending on the mass, the size of the, of the center element, the disk that we're talking about. So they can't be used for measuring energy per pulse of a repetitively pulsed beam because they just can't respond fast enough. A, a beam that's pulsing at one hertz, the thermal sensors will consider that as a CW beam, maybe with a tiny bit of ripple, but not more than that. 
So we, knew you, we use a different kind of sensor for that, usually based on pyroelectric crystals. Again, not going to get into the physics of how those work, but they measure the energy of every pulse at rates up to all sorts of details depending on the size of the disk and the type of absorber and, 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 and. Um, so here you've got little ones, big ones. Again, you can see that there's different kinds of absorbers just from the fact that they look different. Some of them have diffusers built on. Some of them have diffusers that are removable, some diffusers that are fixed, large apertures, small apertures, and so on. Here you see a screenshot from one of our meters showing a pulse chart of a pulse laser. Most pulse lasers don't do this, but it's a pretty cool picture. I thought it would look good. Um, so for pedagogical purposes, I chose an interesting pulse um, uh, behavior, uh, but you get the basic idea. Um, so there are pyroelectric sensors that can measure every pulse at up to, in our case, maximum 25 kilohertz, um, or that can handle high energy densities without damage. It'll depend on the absorber. Sometimes we'll add a diffuser to enable working with even higher energy density, or that have other particular properties. Uh, usually, as you can appreciate, there's some degree of trade-off involved. Uh, you know, sensors with a more durable absorber coating um, are intuitively you would expect that they'll probably be a little bit more limited in pulse rate because the thicker absorber slows down the ability of the pyroelectric crystal deep inside there to respond to faster and faster pulses. There's also always trade-offs. Again, as I said before, it's not for nothing that trade-off is one of the first words you learn in an engineering curriculum. Um, some applications involve energy per pulse, but of a single, sh what we call single shot pulse mode. A number of industrial applications like certain types of welding and some medical applications, particularly some skin care applications, uh, those that work in this mode, you fire one pulse and then you wait, you check, and then you might fire another one. Um, and so those type of lasers will be measured in this mode as well. And there we'll use a thermal sensor usually rather than a pyroelectric sensor, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we fire a pulse and then we wait a couple seconds um, before firing another pulse. In our case, the instrument will tell you that it's ready for the next pulse um, until it finishes integrating the heat that's, that was generated by absorbing the pulse and so on. So the wrong choice of sensor, as you can now appreciate, could lead to improper measurement in a good case, or a zapped or otherwise damaged sensor in a less good case. Here you see some examples of laser damage. Uh, I don't know if you can see clearly, but there's a burn mark that occupies a pretty big fraction of the Sensor's aperture. This is a thermal sensor with a broadband absorber coating, and you can see that there's a burn mark here. This this absorber was exposed to too many watts per square centimeter over much of the absorber's area, much of the aperture. Uh, here is a localized burn mark. There might have been a hot spot in that beam, or it might have just been a small beam. I don't know. And here you see some of the sensors, some of the absorber types are not a coating, but rather are a type of window or filter that are cemented on to the sensor. In this case, you can see that half of it just popped clean off. This is pretty cool. What probably happened here was there must have been a microscopic air bubble in the epoxy that was used to cement on the absorber window filter, whatever, and a particularly high energy density short pulse must have caused that to rupture and the crack to spread in a mechanical failure. I'm just guessing that's probably more or less how that one happened. Pretty slick. I'm sure the owner didn't think so, but it is cool. Um, so we want to choose the right sensor. Now, no need to panic. The truth is most of the thinking can be done for you. We have an online tool that we call the Sensor Finder. You can use it online. You can download it. It basically asks you all the questions that must be answered in order to correctly recommend the best sensor. It asks you, for example, the beam diameter, the wavelength. Are you trying to measure power or energy? It's a pulse beam. Um, minimum and the maximum power or energy or whatever it is. What, you know, and then there's some additional questions that you don't have to answer, but it'll help you narrow the search. For example, if you're 
measurement is only going to be done intermittently, that might widen the range of possible sensors, as we saw earlier. Then you click on Find Sensor, and it'll give you the solutions um, that are most recommended to do the work that you need them to do. Um, okay, let's say a little bit about meters. Um, as we said before, the differences between meters are less technical physical and more technical functional. Uh, um, different meters have different ranges of functionality, um, and that'll be the basis for choosing them, higher end, lower end. Some meters just perform the basic measurements, power, energy, maybe a little bit more. They might give you a little bit of, you know, range of choices of display mode, but, you know, just basic functions. If your needs and or your budget limit you to that, then you have solutions for that. Uh, higher, higher end functional needs in an R&D environment, and assuming that there's an available budget, um, you'll possibly want to look at more, you know, more sophisticated instruments to be able to do the kind of work that you need that to do. Um, some general points to consider. Who's going to be using the instrument and for what purpose? Um, are we talking about a production floor where at the end of a production line of a medical laser, you've got somebody, you know, um, you know, manufacturing technicians just measuring the power, go, no, go, pass, fail, and you know, just that over and over again, and they don't need fancier stuff, or is it an engineering or R&D environment, a quality assurance, maybe somewhere in between, uh, field service engineers who may or may not have a laptop with them, maybe they want to do onboard logging for be, to be able to analyze the measurements later when they get back to the office, etc. What measurement parameters do you need to be able to set? Are you going to need to use your, your instrument for power measurement and energy measurement and all these other different things, and you want to be able to control all of them and, and whatever, and then you'll want to be able to communicate the data to a, you know, to a, a PC or something like that. Basic measurements, or do you need some mathematical functions? Are you going to be working with a multi-channel instrument, and you're going to want to look at the ratios between different, you know, sensor channels and so on? Um, do you want the readings displayed? Some industries like using a virtual analog needle output. Others don't care, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, in general, we can divide meters into standalone and direct to PC interface devices. Here's a standalone device. This is one of a few meter called Starbright connected to a to a thermal sensor. Um, and I should mention, and here's another standalone instrument. This one is called the Centauri Color Touchscreen. Um, I should mention standalone is a bit of a misnomer because most of our standalone, or actually all of our standalone meters can be connected to a PC and communicate with the software running on the PC, but they can also be used not connected to a PC. That's why we call them standalone. As opposed to our direct to PC interfaces, which only work connected to a PC, that, that looks like a slightly fat connector is such a device. It's a full-blown measurement instrument just like this guy is with the, you know, Pico amateur current measurement, all the, you know, the sophisticated processing that gets done, but the displaying is subcontracted out to the software running on the PC. It also does a whole lot more, adds a lot of very powerful capabilities, but, you know, so here, this will only work connected to a PC. So in some environments where all the work is done connected to a, you know, PC laptop network, then this might be a good solution. Uh, Again, all the choices are available. Um, field service, R&D, production floor, everybody, you know, everybody has their own set of needs. Uh, so let's look, first of all, at some standalone. If your needs are only for basic measurements, again, I'm looking at an Ophir in instrument. This is called Starlight. This is the base stick. You know, this is the, uh, I probably shouldn't use specific car examples. I don't want to insult anybody out there. This is the basic level. It does measurements. It gives you a little bit of flexibility in terms of, you know, the uh, output format, digital with bar graph, or here you can see virtual analog needle. It's a, you know, monochrome screen, black and white, not color screen, basic measurements, power, energy. It supports all, the, all, all of the newest Ophir different types of sensor families, but the functionality is limited to measurements and just some very, very basic um, you know, functions in addition to that. 
measurements display modes. Um, when we designed it, we had to think of what can we leave out to keep this as a low end meter. One of the things that was left out is USB connectivity so that it can be connected to a PC, but we didn't want to eliminate it entirely. So one can actually order this uh, and then add on or order it and with the add on at the same time uh, and as an additional optional add on um, USB connected connectivity enabling. So we've got a part number 7Z. I'm Canadian originally, now I'm Israeli. Uh, so all Americans out there will hopefully forgive me for not calling it Z, but calling it Z. Um, 7Z, Z if you want. We have both. Uh, 11049, that's the USB activation code. You can order a Starlight already with that enabled or add that on later if you change your mind, something like that. So that's the Starlight. You can probably guess what the next one's going to be called. If you remember the childhood nursery rhyme, Starlight, Star Bright, First Star I See Tonight, right? You know, I don't, I don't know if that's still out there. Um, this is the Star Bright for a good general range of pretty advanced functions. We have the, the this meter is called Star Bright, C color screen, um, much much more sophisticated range of capabilities, all the latest advanced functions. Um, including support for, for example, remember pulse power mode? So here's pulse power mode. Remember, this was the same image we used before. Um, this is pulse power mode on the Starbright screen. Um, it prompts you to enter the, uh, the pulse width. You don't see that here. Here's in regular energy mode, but whatever, it'll flash ready, and then uh, it'll give you the reading in units of, of power. So that wasn't really pulse power mode, but okay, you'll forgive me. Um, range of graphical display options, line graph, digital numeric readout with bar graph, pulse chart, histogram, statistics screen, virtual analog needle, whatever you want. It's almost like having the PC software, but in a handheld instrument. You can combine functions, so you can set upper and lower pass fail limits, and you're working, you've applied some kind of an averaging, and, 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 and you'll get the combination of all those functions. That's what's going to be numerically displayed. If you're logging data, that's what's going to be logged. If you're in graphical display mode, that's what's going to be graphically displayed. Logging is almost unlimited. The onboard logging actually isn't onboard. Would, the logging would be done to a USB flash disk that gets inserted into that slot over there. So it all virtually unlimited uh, logging capacity. Um, Multilingual, there's currently, I believe, eight languages on the Starbright. Um, okay, still higher up the scale if you want really advanced functionality and you want, you're going to, you know, R&D, engineering, you're going to be spending a lot of time with this instrument. You want it to be, okay, I'm a geek. I can say you want, to be to, you want it to be fun and cool to use and you want it to, to have, you know, still more sophisticated capabilities more hardware capabilities in terms of the range of interfaces available uh, and you know multi-channel device maybe so we've got what we call centauri which released a couple years back seven inch full color touch screen single channel and dual channel versions available and i should mention there's an upgrade path from single to dual so if you start with single now you can upgrade that to a dual later if you need to um, with all the dual channel functionality that goes with that. There's an interesting combination of things that usually don't go together. Very advanced functionality, but extremely easy and intuitive to use. Uh, very large screen on a very compact device. Uh, this is an interesting device. Um, 7Z11056, single to dual channel upgrade. Um, Okay, you get the idea. Just a few screenshots here. The regular um, screenshot of ordinary dual channel uh, mode where the two channels are separate. They can be completely independently configured um, or you can combine them on one graph. And so here's channel A, channel B color coded and you open a math channel. Let's say the ratio between A and B or some other mathematical function um, if you know, whatever it is that you need to be doing. Um, color screen so you can adjust the, the color scheme to get best, you know, the best contrast if you're working with different laser safety goggles. Um, it supports all the different measurement modes and uh, sensor families. Here you see a screenshot from 
We have a family of sensors we call beam track that measure the power and the position and the size of the beam at the same time. So here you can see the power and both numerically and graphically you can see, see the beam position and the beam size. Okay, that's supported, um, that's also supported by the star light uh, and the star bright, by the way. But here you, it just, you, you can see the, you know, the power of this. Um, range of functions that you can choose from. You can control the, the display modes, um, statistics, screens, all sorts of stuff. Not going to go through all the options right now. Virtual analog needle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, direct to PC interfaces. Um, as we said, they're full-blown measuring instruments, except the displaying and quite a bit of additional processing power is taken care of by the PC software. Um, in Ophir's case, our PC software application is called StarLab. That's for USB speaking devices. We've got some other instruments that speak, R we've got a bunch of instruments that speak RS-232, different software used for that, whatever. Doesn't, we're gonna get into that now. Um, you can download that from our website for free, by the way, so you can even download it twice if you want. Um, so for USB interface, we've got this, remember you saw this guy a couple slides ago, that little fat connector. We call that Juno. It's powered by the USB. Sensor plugs into here, USB key, micro USB from here, micro mini, I don't remember, from here to the PC, and your work will be with the, with the PC. Uh, Juno Plus, which is the same as a Juno, but it also has an analog output with configurable full-scale analog voltage. Um, we've got a couple of multi-channel devices. We call that Pulsar 1, 2, and 4 channel versions. Ethernet connectivity, if you need to work, let's say, remotely or whatever re your reason is for needing to work over, uh, over an Ethernet network, uh, we, this device is called the EA1. Uh, we've also got a solution if cables are a potential problem for you. <clears throat> we have a wireless Bluetooth instrument called Quasar uh, from 10 to a few tens of meters, depending on what you've got in between, um, and then Everything else is otherwise the same. Now, all the details, differences, that already comes down to the technical details in the specification of each device. Again, don't panic. The, there's a lot of help available um, to help you choose the best instrument for your needs. Um, but again, as always, the more you understand what the considerations are, the better these tools will serve you. We have a meter finder like we have a sensor finder. Unlike the sensor finder, the meter finder is not actually a software tool because, again, here the differences aren't technical, so that we can't really calculate what the best meter will be for you. This is more like a set of comparison tables, um, you know, which types of measurement modes are available with each of the different instruments as you move from, you know, the lower end to the higher end to the lower end. Um, measurement modes, which sensor families are maybe not supported by some of the older meters, um, compatibility table, it's all here. So again, no need to panic, but as always, the better you understand what the ingredients were that were tossed into the pot, the better you'll be able to make sure that you're getting you know, the right results. Uh, so in summary, 52 minutes, okay, two minutes past my estimated time. We looked at the differences between the different types of sensors and we looked at a lot, I won't say all, but most of the main considerations that go into choosing the sensor. We looked at the differences between meters. We looked at just, I think, three, three or four specific examples. We've got a lot more, but again, the main ideas that one wants to think about in deciding what the best meter is for your needs. Uh, and probably the most important element uh, that I hope you'll take away from here is the don't panic part. There are tools available you know, um, software tools, you know, comparison lot tools available on our website. You can download them to help make sure that you're getting, you know, you're making the best choice of sen sensor and meter of measurement solution for your needs. Um, don't panic. I love this. This is, uh, I assume you probably recognize this. This is Starman driving Elon Musk's uh, Tesla Roadster. Right, well, here it's when he was still in Earth orbit. Now he's somewhere out near Jupiter or something like that. I don't know. And here he's being told, yes, 
you're in a you know you're in deep space in orbit near Jupiter uh, with you know in an open roof sports car, but no need to panic. Everything will be fine. That of course I assume most of you recognize that that is a nod to Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm dating myself. I'm well aware of that, um, but. Again, don't panic. The best don't panic tool really is just to speak to us, our representatives, you know, and using all the different channels of getting in contact with us that I mentioned at the beginning. We'll be more than happy to help you. We're as interested as you are in helping you make sure that you're making the best choice for your needs. There is no best instrument. There's the best instrument for what you needed to do. Um, so hopefully that message is made clear. Uh, that's what I wanted to get across. So thank you very much for being with us. If you have any questions you want to ask online, got a couple more seconds in which to do that. Otherwise, as I said, you're, I'm going to leave this up for a few minutes after we're done. So if you want to get a hold of me offline, you're more than welcome to do that. Or you can contact us through our website, through our representatives in your various countries, your fear offices or our re representatives, depending on the country. Um, I hope this was helpful. Dare I say, maybe even interesting. Um, my name again is Mark Slutsky. I'm the Product Manager for Power and Energy Measurement Solutions here at Ophir Photonics. This is my uh, my email address. Um, our website is, well, you can get to the Ophir website from the MKS website, or you can go to ophiropt.com and go to the Ophir, to the Photonics group from there. It'll all bring you to the same place. This is my email address. I'm going to leave this up. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Stay healthy. Stay sane. Stay, stay sane. Sorry, it's late. Uh, and have a very nice rest of the day.